for your patience. Um, yeah, technical difficulties um, <laughs> as we're all living in the Zoom world. Um, but yeah, as I was talking to myself for a little bit there, <laughs> I was saying, thanks so much everyone um, for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Ren Smith. I'm a community organizer with Colorado Sierra Club. I'm so excited to welcome you all to our virtual launch party for the Accelerate Climate Action Campaign. Um, so 2020 was a really big year for coal retirement in Colorado, and we need 2021 to be even bigger. So that's why we're turning up the heat on XL Energy, Colorado's biggest utility, and the only one left in the state still planning to burn coal past 2030. So tonight we'll be diving into Sierra Club's new report on utility climate pledges and learn where Excel really stands on the pathway to clean energy. We'll also hear from local activists on just a few of the many different impacts that Excel is having on communities all across Colorado. There will be opportunities for you to take action here with us tonight, as well as an invitation for you to join the movement and stay up to date with even more opportunities to help us move Excel towards 100% renewable energy. So we uh, aim to wrap up by about 8 p.m. tonight, but we can also stay on the line an additional 10 or 15 minutes to take any extra questions that you might have. So I want to give a big thank you to our co-hosts for tonight's launch party, 350 Colorado and Clean Energy Action. And I especially want to shout out my co-facilitator for tonight's presentation, Amy Gray, um, with 350 Colorado, and also thank you for that great land acknowledgement. Um, before I hand it over to her, I'm going to lead us in a quick activity to get us grounded and ready to learn about Excel. And um, also because I'm really curious about uh, all of your thoughts on Excel. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So just give me one second to get the activity situated. Great, so I just pasted some instructions in the chat. I'm gonna share my screen here and... Um, so as I pasted in the chat, um, you're gonna go ahead and go to menti.com. This is just a quick little shared presentation that I have for you guys. Um, you can enter the code um, 1518983. Um, again, it's all copy pasted in the chat. Um, but this is going to generate um, kind of like live um, a map that'll show us the words that come to mind when we think of Excel Energy. So if you go um, to the link menti.com and put in the code, you should be able to enter the first three words that come to mind of Excel. And then we should be able to actually watch the results populate here. Um, so go ahead and navigate to the website and enter um, the first things that come to mind. Awesome, I'm seeing some thoughts come in here. And if you're having any issues um, with the website at all, also feel free to use the chat to share your thoughts. Um, yeah, but this is awesome. I'm seeing racist, coal is a big one. Also the way this map works is the bigger the word is, the more often it's coming up for folks. So we see the word pollution really big here. Um, coal, monopoly um, are some of our biggest themes that are showing up. Um, yeah, fire is one that I see maybe getting into some of um, our experiences with climate change. Environmental racism is a really important one to highlight. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank you all so much for um, sharing your thoughts and participating in that activity. I'm going to wait just a few more seconds so we can see uh, what else we have come in. Yeah, I think I saw Denver, some of the communities that Excel represents. Yeah, this is awesome. I'm gonna go ahead and stop my uh, screen share, but yeah, thank you so much to everyone who um, participated in that activity. I think that was um, great to kind of get us thinking. Um, yeah, uh, cool. And then uh, feel free to continue to, to add thoughts um, if you have more that you'd like to share. Um, excellent. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass it over to Amy to introduce our first speaker to, for tonight. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Amy, um, and I'm the Volunteer and Jedi Director at 350 Colorado and the lead campaigner for um, our Joint Coal Coalition. Um, and I am very excited to introduce 
Um, Anna McDevitt, um, she's a senior campaign representative at the Sierra Club Beyond Coal campaign for Colorado and New Mexico. And I have had the absolute pleasure um, of working alongside Anna for years um, on coal um, in Colorado. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Anna to finish introducing herself. Thanks, Amy. That was a really nice introduction. Um, hey everyone, my name is Anna McDevitt. Like Amy said, uh, I work with the Sierra Club. I work with our Beyond Coal campaign um, and I cover mostly Colorado, New Mexico, but we have a lot of coal and gas in Colorado. So I spend most of my time in Colorado because we have a ways to go. So um, Ren and Amy asked me to speak tonight to share a little bit about a report that uh, Sierra Club released last month titled the Dirty, the Dirty Truth About Utility Climate Pledges. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the report, but also um, what the findings were for Excel Energy Colorado, just so that as we launch this Accelerate Climate Action campaign together, we are all on the same page about what we're working with and, and what the gap is and, and where we need to go from here. So Ren, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Perfect. Um, and I can just finish introduction, introducing myself really quick. Uh, that's what I look like. That's my dog. You can kind of see him. His name's Barkley. Um, if we were doing this in Benton person, he would probably be here. Uh, I prefer she, her pronouns, please. And I just wanted to share a fun fact with you all, which is that I'm getting chickens on Saturday and I'm very excited about it. I'm going to be a chicken mom. Um, and so actually I'm going to share my email at the end of, of these slides. And if you have chickens in Colorado, I would love to hear about your experience if you have any tips. So I'm open to all coal related and chicken related emails. <laughs> Next slide, please. Cool, so again, our report was called The Dirty Truth About Utility Climate Pledges. Uh, and I'm actually gonna um, share a link in the chat here just so that y'all can check it out if you'd like to. Um, so give me a second while I do that. This report was inspired because, you know, at this point, a lot of utilities across the country have made a commitment to um, net zero by at some point. Um, here, I put the report in the chat. So Excel Energy was actually one of the first utilities to do that back in 2018. Uh, they announced a commitment to 80% carbon reductions by 2030, as well as 100% carbon reductions by 2050. Um, since then, many, many, many utilities have made similar um, commitments and actually have even raised the bar. Uh, some utilities plan to hit 100% carbon reductions by 2030. Others plan to do it by 2040, such as some of the utilities in our neighboring state of New Mexico. Um, Excel is still committed to 100% by 2050. But as all these utilities were making these commitments, we were realizing it doesn't seem like the amount of clean energy that we're investing in is actually at pace with where we need to be by 2030, 2040, and 2050 based on different commitments. And so we wanted to look at the data to figure out, are these pledges actually leading to meaningful action? Um, and, and what does that look like across the country? And what we found is that actually a lot of utilities are greenwashing their climate commitments. And we feel really strongly that we need to hold them accountable to that. So what we did was we looked at the largest 50 utility parent companies across the country. Um, so a parent company would be like XL Energy, for example, and then XL Energy has three operating companies. XL Colorado is one of them. XL Minnesota is another. And then XL Texas, New Mexico is the third. Um, and so we looked at 50 parent companies as well as 79 operating companies, including XL Energy Colorado. Um, and we ranked them based on their transition plans over the next 10 years and on three actions that we see as absolutely critical to combating climate change and staving off the worst impacts of climate change. Um, next slide, please. So this is how we um, this is how we scored the utilities, and we actually have a much longer algorithm that I didn't bother to share on here, um, but you can find it in the link there. Um, but I mentioned that there were three actions that we felt really strongly um, we needed to see to combat climate change. Um, and so we ranked the utilities based on those. And so the two that earned utilities points was if they committed to retiring their coal by 2030. Uh, another one that earns the utilities points is if they plan to build any clean energy between 20. 20 and 2030. And then the third big thing, um, which is actually how a lot of utilities lose points, and by a lot, I mean a lot, uh, is planning to build new gas. At this point, 
the line is in the sand on gas, we can literally not afford both our wallets and our climate and our health to continue building gas plants that we're going to be paying for for years. And so um, if utilities have plans to build new dirty gas plants, we dock them points. And then we range them um, by, by grades. So we have A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's. And you can kind of see how those numbers break down on the bottom there. Um, basically, when you do the math for those three actions, it adds up to a score between zero and 100. Um, and then we broke down those numbers into some letter grades. And so if you can go to the next slide, I can share a little bit more about what we found on the bigger scale. So before I dive into Excel Colorado specifically, I wanted to share one of the main key findings of the report, which is that a lot of these utility climate pledges are just they're just hot air like they're not actually doing anything meaningful for near term ambition and action to retire fossil fuels and invest in clean energy. Um, and so actually, if you look at the right side of this slide here, you can see that uh, when we looked at all the companies with a net zero pledge of some sort, we found that the average score for those utilities who again are calling themselves climate leaders right like they've committed to 100% and net zero and things like that. The, the, on average, they got 20 out of 100. That's a D. Um, and so on average, these utilities that are, you know, looking like climate leaders because of commitments, they really haven't done that much and, and they're scoring a D in the transition. And that's not that much different um, from when you look at the companies that don't have these climate pledges and you can see that number right below. Uh, the average score there was 14. The other number that I want to highlight on this slide is if you look at um, the percent of coal committed to retire by 2030 for the companies that do have those net zero pledges, only 27% of their coal is slated for retirement. And so we just have a lot of work to do to make sure that utilities are actually doing what they say they're going to do and that they're doing it as soon as possible um, so that we can reduce emissions as soon as possible. So next slide. So Here's um, basically just a, an array of all the utilities and how they scored. Um, and right now, based on Excel's current commitments, they would have a 37 out of 100. That's Excel Energy Colorado, to be specific, and that's a C. If you've taken um, the time to look at the report yourself, you'll notice that in the report, Excel Energy Colorado has a D. That's because the data for the report is based on information from December 2020. And um, folks might know that on January 4th, Excel Energy Colorado um, committed to retire at Hayden Coal Plant up near Steamboat Springs. Um, so it's going to retire both Hayden Unit 1 and 2 by, um, by 27 and 20, 2027 and 2028. Um, and so they got some points for that. Um, it bumped them up from a D to a C. But um, before that, they did have a D. They had 31 out of 100. And I also want to point out that Excel Energy Colorado is doing worse than the parent company, Excel Energy. They're literally bringing Excel Energy's grade down because they still have so much fossil fuels on their system. Um, and a lot of that's just because Excel Minnesota is doing a lot better than Excel Colorado in that they do actually have plans to be coal free by 2030. And so there's no reason that we couldn't be doing that here in Colorado, especially as a state that has some of the best solar and wind potential in the country. Next slide, please. This is just for fun. I don't think we need to spend long on this slide, but this is how the utility parent companies broke down across the country. Um, for different colors and different grades. So A's are green, B's are yellow, C's are dark blue, D's are light blue, and F's are red. Um, if you look at Colorado, um, right there in the middle, we're, we're very blue. And actually, most of Colorado should be dark blue, because again, um, we had the, we had the, um, we didn't have updated information by December 2020 for the January announcement. Um, but the thing here that I just want to point out is, this, our part of our country just has some of the best wind and solar in the country. There's no reason that our state should still be dark blue with a C on a report like this. We have some of the windiest Eastern Plains and we have solar all up and down the Front Range and West Slope and the Southern part of our state has tons of solar potential. So there's just no reason that we need to be blue and we're gonna be working to change that and we'd love your help. Next slide. So there's an interactive piece of our report where you can just type in a utility and see what their grade was and, and why their grade was that way. And so this is what it is for Excel Colorado, though I had to get a little bit creative <laughs> um, and uh, change it based on new information with the Hayden units retiring. Again, they have a 37 out of 100, that's a C. 
And at this point, now with Hayden announced, Excel Energy has only committed to retiring 50% of its coal. They only have plans for half of their coal to come offline. And here they are saying that they're gonna reach 80% carbon reductions by 2030 and 100% by 2050. Um, we need them to be moving a lot faster than that. And so I think that's just a really important fact to know and tell. Um, they only have plans to retire 50% of their coal. The next little green circle over here is how much clean energy they have planned to replace existing fossil fuels. And Excel only has plans to replace existing fossil fuels um, with clean energy for 23% of the electricity that they provide. Uh, so there's obviously a really long ways to go there. And then lastly, I wanna point out this, this gas circle here. This one's a little interesting right now, and it's just indicative of the kind of um, the snapshot of XO Energy at this point in time. So just kind of click, this is what they look like right now, but it probably won't look like this for a while. Um, Excel currently doesn't have any gas plants they plan to build, but at the end of March, they have to file a plan at the Colorado Public Utilities Commission called an IRP, which stands for an Integrated Resource Plan, uh, where they plan what kind of generation resources they think they need to provide electricity to Coloradans. Um, so for example, if they need more electricity resources because Denver is growing so quickly and other parts of our state are growing so quickly. Um, we expect that Excel Energy will propose new gas here. We don't know that, but we expect it. And if they do, they will be crossing a line. Um, and we're going to have to fight really hard to stop it because we cannot afford to build new gas in our state at this point. Um, and, and that would um, lower their score as well, right, if they started to add gas as well. Next slide. So before I wrap this up, I just wanted to um, kind of give some places and, and, and context to some of these numbers for Excel. So the 50% of Excel's coal that's left um, is these two green arrows here. It's the Pawnee coal plant and the Comanche coal plant. Um, the Pawnee coal plant is like a medium to large coal plant. It's about 500 megawatts. And the Comanche 3 coal plant is huge. Um, it's about 800 megawatts. And uh, it's the biggest coal plant in our state. It's also the largest source of carbon pollution in the state of Colorado as well. And so that's what we're working with when we're talking about um, what, what coal plants we still need to retire in the state of Colorado. Um, in addition to being XL's only coal plants left, these are also just the only coal plants in Colorado that are slated to run past 2030, as Ren mentioned earlier. And then before we move on to the next slide, I wanted to just see how much folks in the room on the Zoom know about gas and Excel's gas in Colorado. If folks wouldn't mind using the chat, how many gas plants do y'all think Excel has in Colorado burning fossil fuels in our community? And if folks aren't familiar with the chat, it's a little button on the bottom with a little bubble above it. And if you click on it, the chat will come up on the right side and you can type things into all of us. I see too many, I see 10 to 15, 13, five, 20, 30, eight. Cool. Well, so the good news is that y'all definitely have the sense that Excel has way too much gas already in our state. Um, thankfully, it's not 20 to 30 gas plants. Excel currently has nine gas plants in Colorado, though that could change if they plan to propose any new ones, right? Um, and we definitely don't want to get into the double digits on gas plants that we as ratepayers are going to end up having to pay for um, over, over the next several years. So they have nine. And Ren, if you go to the next slide, I can show folks where those are. This is a really bad picture. It's a screenshot that I took right before this call. So I apologize, but I pulled this off of SPP. This is where Excel's gas plants are. Um, and a couple of these dots, I think, probably represent a couple gas plants, just because you'll notice there's not all nine of the dots there. But the interesting thing is a lot of these gas plants are in the Denver metro area, and that's because a lot of them were switched from coal plants to gas plants um, back in the early 2010s. Uh, and that's no good. You know, gas plants, unfortunately, have this false narrative out there about them um, as far as being, you know, the clean fuel, and it's just not true. Gas plants emit nitrogen oxide, they emit sulfur dioxides, they emit particulate matter, and all those pollutions cause things like ozone and smog, which cause things like asthma attacks and hospital visits, and so they're just no good for our communities, and we really shouldn't have this many gas plants in our state, let alone in the most populated part of our state that already is dealing with a lot of air pollution issues. Um, next slide. So 
We have a lot of gas plants in the state still. We have a lot of coal plants in the state still. But the good news is that people power is pushing Colorado to a clean energy future. And that's been happening for a while now. And it's because of people like the folks on this call. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'll show you some pictures of the last big action that I think a lot of folks on this call probably helped with, which was a letter that we, um, 350 and Sierra Club and Mothers Out Front delivered to uh, Exxon Energy this fall five months ahead of when they have to file their plan. Again, that's next month, because uh, we wanted to give them time to plan for what our communities wanted. And so we asked for no coal by 2030, no new gas, and lots of clean energy, as well as several other things. And over 4,000 Coloradans signed that, including 80 elected officials from all across the state. And so the movement is strong, the momentum is strong, um, and now we just need to make sure that Excel delivers on what communities are asking for. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Ren? So the last thing I want to do here is, you know, we've got about a month and a half before Excel files this plan, and we're going to need to roll up our sleeves and get going. Um, I want to invite everyone to take a quick action right now to make sure that Excel is feeling the pressure um, and knows that their plan is going to be watched closely. Um, if folks go to Twitter, if you are a tweeter, if you if you tweet, um, go to Twitter and you'll you see my handle on the on the slide here. And right before the call, I tweeted a little tweet at Excel Energy, um, as well as sharing the petition that folks can sign, asking them to do the things that we've been talking about. And um, please copy and paste that tweet or write something along those lines or share the petition or retweet, whatever works. I just wanna make sure Excel Energy is feeling the heat leading up to March. Um, and with that, if you go to the next slide, Ren, and actually I'll just put my handle on the side here in case folks are still opening Twitter up. Um, that's my email. That's my Twitter handle. I would love to get in touch. So feel free to reach out if you need questions. And with that, I'll pass it over to our host, Ren and Amy. Thank you so much, Anna. That I was really excited to hear all of this about this report. Um, and I'm sure that we'll be referencing it for months to come. <laughs> Very excited. Um, and so with that, um, I'd like to introduce um, our next speaker. Um, up next, we have um, Velma Campbell. Um, Velma is um, an MB, MD and MPH. She's a board certified in occupational medicine, um, the American Board of Preventative Medicine. She has a private practice in Pueblo. Um, she's a member of the American Public Health Association and the American Academy of Family Practice. Um, she belongs to Physicians for Social Responsibility Colorado chapter, um, is the vice chair and conservation chair of Sierra Club Sangre de Cristo group, um, and also is a member of Mothers Out Front Colorado. Um, so welcome, Velma. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate in this conversation. And um, it's a very important topic, personally very important to me too. So um, I was asked um, when I was first invited to participate to give a little bit of a personal insight into um, why this topic is important to me and the images that came to mind were from my childhood in the Appalachian areas of Virginia and West Virginia, seeing scenes of damage from strip mining and coal mining on car trips with mom and dad as they commented, look what they're doing to the land, look how they're leaving these giant piles of coal waste and, um, and leaving these scars. And they don't need to be making that mess, they're only doing it for the money. Also, the hazards faced by the coal workers were apparent in their coal blackened faces and the, and the harsh coughs as they waited in line in the banks of the stores, leaving a big impression on me as a child. Um, as many of these folks' fathers were, uh, I mean, many of these folks were fathers of my school chums. So that's where the story of coal fired electricity begins. And it ends, as you can see in these pictures, with pollution in our communities like Pueblo's relationship with the XL number three Comanche generating station. XL number three coal fired power plant emits many uh, thousands of tons of pollution into the air of our community 
as you can see in these photos by my colleague, uh, Jamie Valdez on the left, taken just a few days ago, um, showing the uh, billowing emissions from the smokestacks. To the right, the smaller picture is my, uh, my own photo. Um, it's a little hard to see, but the cloud that you see around the plant is actually coal dust flying up in the air from the open um, stored coal ready to be burned. And that's another form of air pollution from coal-fired power plants. Um, this, uh, this plant, as I said, emits many thousands of tons of pollution into the air of our community, but the power goes to the Denver area, not to Pueblo, except for a small uh, amount to the steel mill. Mind you, even if we were getting 100% of the power, it still wouldn't be a good deal for Pueblo because it's a coal-fired plant. Um, so as my colleague and friend, uh, Jamie says, Pueblo gets all of the pollution and none of the power. XL does not plan to close this plant until about 2070, which is inexcusable. And you can see um, in the current slide, the uh, EPA greenhouse gas data page, uh, which is readily available, a public uh, option that you can get um, uh, access to, to uh, look up greenhouse gas pollution. The, um, Excel number three released more than 8 million tons of CO2 in 2019, as well as methane, nitrous oxide, and other pollutants, which we'll talk about more in a little bit later. Because there are good jobs for some people in Pueblo in both the power plant and the steel mill that it powers, we as climate justice advocates are very committed and our support for transitions that include requiring Excel to provide for the preservation of these good union jobs while they're making the move to clean energy. The story is not entirely bleak. In cooperation with Excel, the um, Everest steel plant is on track to be one of the first, uh, if not the first entire solar powered steel mills in the country. So there's even less excuse for them to stay with the uh, coal-fired plant much past 2025 or 2028, which would be our goals. So what are some of the health statistics here in Pueblo that make us concerned about air pollution? Um, and while we're thinking about that, here's a question for um, folks to think about. We know that air pollution is bad for lung disease. So how many of us here have asthma or have a friend or family member with asthma, or I would add even COPD? Ren, let's see that next slide. From the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, we can see that Pueblo has a greater burden of several serious chronic diseases than the Colorado average. The one that catches my eye is the COPD, which is 9.9%. Um, these numbers are adults who have ever had one of these diagnoses. So we have 9.9% of adults in Pueblo have ever been diagnosed with COPD, which is more than twice the Colorado average. And in addition to facing a higher rate of serious health conditions than the rest of Pueblo, I mean, than the rest of Colorado, sorry. Pueblo is a majority Latinx community with an average income significantly less than the state or national averages. We know that polluting facilities and industries are more likely to be located in such communities. We also know that COVID-19 impacts these communities harder and that air pollution is associated with worse COVID-19 impacts. So let's talk now about some health impacts from coal-fired power plants. This um, <clears throat> poor individual here on the picture has problems in just about every system, which um, is consistent with the health impacts of coal-fired power plants. 
They produce air pollution, including fine particulates that are so small, they can get deep into the lungs and into the bloodstream, carrying toxic chemicals with them. Particle pollution is associated not just with vague statistical shortening of overall lifespans, but with increased emergency visits and deaths from heart and lung disease on days with high air pollution. These plants also directly release sulfur and nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, and, uh, and hazardous air pollutants, also known as air toxics. These substances are well known or likely to cause harm to the environment and to human health and can include acid gases, benzene, toluene, lead, arsenic, mercury, other metals, formaldehyde, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and others. These can, these can be found on EPA websites and numerous academic and organizational sites as well. Many people will say, well, that's just steam coming out of the plant. We know better. Also, nitrogen dioxide emissions contribute to the formation of ozone, which is related to heart and lung disease, as anyone who's been in Denver on a high ozone day can tell you, both short and long term. These pollutants from coal-fired power plants act separately and in combination on those living near the plants to worsen conditions such as lung disease, including asthma and COPD, heart and vascular disease, such as coronary artery disease, heart attacks, strokes, blood clots, as well as producing negative effects on the nervous system, including decreased intellectual capability, increased cerebrovascular ischemia, and it's a, so they are associated with cancer. Also, there's documentation of poor child health and poor infant health in these areas. It is estimated from the particulate pollutants by themselves from coal-fired power plants, as many as 52,000 premature deaths occur annually in the United States. Also, carbon dioxide of the 8 million tons, which you heard about earlier, is a major pollutant from burning coal and contributes to climate change with all those related health and environmental effects. To me, the most troubling aspect of this story of pollution-related illness and death is that pollution-related illness and death from coal-fired power plants is preventable. And every day that it continues, people from someone's family die unnecessarily. So let's end fossil fuels sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Velma, that thinking about all those health impacts, that's, that's really heavy, especially right now during the respiratory pandemic. Um, so thank you so much for all that amazing information. Um, so next, I would like to introduce uh, Liliana Flanagan. Um, <coughs> Liliana is a community organizer and activist based in Grand Junction, Colorado. She serves as one of three youth co-leads for the Colorado Climate Strike Coalition and was the lead organizer of the Grand Valley Earth Week Coalition. She formerly served as the chair of the West Slope Youth Vote Program and the chair of the Education Committee of Grand Valley Students United. Her work has encompassed many large issue areas and is focused on bridging the gap of active activism between rural and urban areas. She's a current student at New York University. She plans to earn a bachelor's degree in politics she hopes to follow her college career, um, college years with a long career of public service and constant impact on her community. Um, she is passionate about the environment, outdoor recreation, and equity among all communities. Welcome, Liliana. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks, Amy, for a great introduction. I know it all sounded very formal. She was definitely reading like my standard bio that I have, but I wanted everyone on the call to know. Amy said I was lit, so I just want to put that out there because um, that made me feel really good about myself. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, like Amy said, I'm a student at New York University, but I'm based here in Grand Junction on the Western Slope. <laughs> she was going to say it. Um, 
And um, I'm really happy to be here with you all today. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about uh, some personal experiences that I've had um, with you know, how climate change has affected me and how climate change affects desert climates out here in the West. Um, and so just a few little things about me. I have a dog, his name's Lafayette. Um, I really love to hike. Um, and um, just be outside in general. Um, and I have been a community organizer for now going on five years um, and it has just been the best thing I could have ever been involved with. So um, you can go ahead and go on to the next slide. So something I wanna do before I get going, um, how have you seen direct impacts of climate change happening in your part of the state? So that could be fires a lot of us experienced, um, Velma brought up asthma and health impacts. Um, so just if you're comfortable throw in the chat um, and, and let us know how, how is climate change impacting you directly? Mm -hmm. I'm seeing drought, fires, shorter rafting season. Sandy, I'm right there with you. I didn't get enough time to paddleboard this summer. <laughs> Smoke, drought, increased utility bills. That's a really good one. Bird mortality. Mm -hmm. I see from originally from Louisiana, Jade says intense hurricanes. Yeah, smoke disease yeah so all of these are great keep keep them coming um because we'll we'll chat about them in a minute um and i i want to warn anxiety for gardeners i know my my garden needed a lot of water this summer um i also just want to warn all of you this is going to be a pretty pretty casual conversation i mean i by no means am as qualified as velma and anna to to be talking about about climate change and the like so um i just want to tell you a little bit about my personal experience so the photo that you saw in the in that first photo that had my name on it um on the first slide and this one those were photos of smoke from the pine gulch fire so um all of you, I mean, it made national news. I'm assuming that, that it was um, something that you saw. Um, the Pine Gulch Fire um, out here in Western Colorado was behind the book cliffs. I could see it out this window that I'm sitting in front of now, about 20 miles from me is where it started. So it started by a lightning strike. So it's not like someone left a match lit or forgot to put out their fire when they were camping or whatever. There's nothing anybody could have done. Um, it started on July 31st, 2020. Now I went on a camping trip uh, and I came back on August 2nd or 1st. Um, and when I came back after seeing the plume of smoke as I was leaving, when I came back, I saw that the entire valley was covered with smoke as I was driving in. It spread amazingly quickly. The vegetation is dry as is, but we hadn't been having much precipitation and the fire was almost impossible for the firefighters to control. And the weather patterns became so very bizarre that there were lightning storms in the smoke, um, which should probably frighten all of you. Um, so on August 18th um, was the biggest spread. So it spread over 30,000 acres in one night. So you go to bed tonight and you wake up thinking, hmm, I wonder how much the fire has spread. Um, and you go to check, because all of us, the majority of us would check every day. Um, the fire spread over 30,000 acres, which, I mean, someone should drop a, an example in the chat of, you know, some something pretty standard that's a few acres so that we can, we can get a a, a real feel for how, how big that is because it's a lot of land. So the Pine Gulch fire eventually became the largest fire in wildfire in state history. And scarily enough, uh, it was overtaken about a week later by another one. And then that one was overtaken. So fires, <clears throat> excuse me, like a lot of you said, have been a really big issue. So this photo that you see um, is, I was coming down from a hike on, on the Grand Mesa. I'm sure you're seeing a theme here. I'm outside a lot um, and uh, I was coming down and this was the view from from um, the middle of, of the Grand Mesa, which is about 11,000 feet up. Um, so it was, uh, it was pretty scary. You can go to the next slide. 
So um, it was raining ash. I mean, I our, my dog tracked ash inside. Um, it was all over, we were breathing it in. Um, you can see in this video, I saw it had collected on my windshield wipers. And so what I did was I um, took a video to see how, how much would come off. And I have to tell you, you can see here, it's a lot. Um, it looks like when, when you wipe snow off your car, except it wasn't. So that's something we were breathing it in. Um, we were cough, everyone in the community was coughing. Um, and like Velma and Amy both said, there is a respiratory disease going around um, that's pretty major. So that was a, a concern of community health on top of this worldwide um, health scare that we have been having. Uh, you can go ahead and go on to the next one. So what does organizing look like? So I just told you about all of these, these examples of, of a direct effect on climate change that I couldn't directly do anything about. I could not drive over to the book cliffs with my garden hose and put out the fire. Um, thankfully, we had amazing people to do that for us. And you know, all of us here in Colorado, uh, definitely thankful for, for all of the, the people who were involved in fighting the, the wildfires. But it's frustrating when you have a big issue like this that is built up for so long because of so many reasons. Some people aren't willing to pinpoint one or the other. Um, and you can't do anything about it directly. And that's where community organizing comes in. Now, community organizing, um, sorry, my light keeps turning off. So this is, this is what you're gonna get. Um, so community organizing comes in many forms. Um, here you can see this was us pre-COVID, of course, lobbying at the state capitol. So you can organize in a legislative sense. You can organize people to testify on bills and, and do bill tracking, but a lot of that requires you know, some sort of expertise and understanding, you know, some legal language, and that's not always accessible for everybody. Um, so finding a person who can help organize you around a piece of legislation that's important, that could be community organizing. Um, strikes, protests, that's something that a lot of us do. Um, and general congregating, however that looks during this very strange era of, of virtual everything. Um, but organizing comes in, in many different forms, but what's important is that somebody or a group of people is helping coordinate one specific action so that everyone is better off in the end. You can go to the next slide. So something that, that is, I think most important to me at least is celebrating. So acts of celebration as, as resistance are, are a big deal. And you can see here, you know, uh, in our little word cloud, cool little thingy that, that Ren put together, um, we saw environmental racism come up quite a bit. Um, and it should be acknowledged that pollution, um, all of a lot of these health issues, um, and all of these other things come in the form of environmental racism, and they are affecting our Black and Indigenous communities of color the most. And so as we organize ourselves and bring people together, you know, we, we want to exercise being joyful and exercise um, our public um, joy of, of just existing. Um, and celebrating is a big part of that. And, and I think it's worth, worth saying a lot of us get bogged down by, you know, this climate change thing, starting fires and, you know, making some, some weird hurricanes. Um, but really, you know, to, to resist that and to, to fight back, showing the people that make decisions that we are willing to fight for what's right is what's the most important thing. Another thing is educating people um, from different backgrounds, whether it's on a climate issue or something as, you know, far off as gun violence or, you know, all of these issues span a very, very broad range. But educating and getting different perspectives on the specific issues are a huge part of organizing people to help the decision makers understand why the change needs to be made and why the situation so dire. And the last thing I want to mention is facilitating hard conversations. So, you know, I, I saw in the chat earlier, there's some people from Carbondale and Glenwood Springs and the like, um, people who live in rural areas like myself, um, Grand Junction could be considerably more rural, but um, I would say uh, it's pretty rural. Um, and a lot of people here, for example, depend on 
oil and gas and coal um, for their jobs. It's an industry that employs them. And they have a very per different perception of the direction those industries should go than I do. And their concern for their family is just as valid as my concern for my respiratory health. But when, when somebody steps in and when a group organizes this conversation to, to facilitate this this very opposite, these two opposite points of view, that's where we have to come to the consensus. And rural areas consistently get left out of the climate conversation, um, which is, is not uncommon for a lot of states, but it's a sentiment over here on the Western Slope that you know we get left out of a lot of decisions, whether that's education funding or climate change legislation. So facilitating hard conversations and meeting people where they are is a huge part of community organizing. And if you have one takeaway from what I had to say tonight, um, I would say let that be it, um, because it is just so important to, to bring people together um, to come to an understanding, because I would like to think that ultimately everyone wants what's best. Um, some people just have different perceptions of either what that is or how to get there. Um, so that's basically all I have to say. Um, I would love to be in contact with any of you. Um, follow me on Instagram, on Twitter. Um, I'm happy to take DMs or whatever if you have questions or comments, or if you'd like to send me an email, um, happy to field that as well. There's my email right here. So go ahead and take a screenshot or, or whatever you'd like to do. Um, and uh, I love to, to be in contact with any of you. So feel free to reach out. Um, and again, thank you all for, for having me and listening to, to some of my little tidbits. And I hope it, hope it made a difference for you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Liliana, and um, all of our speakers here tonight. Um, yeah, that was so much great information. Um, yeah, well, um, and thank you also to all of our attendees for being here. Um, yeah, I hope you learned a lot. Um, so as we can see, um, Excel's decisions as to which energy resources to use have really far reaching implications. And we could be doing much more as a state to protect our climate and our public health. Now, thankfully we have a really huge opportunity to change all of this and it's starting up real soon at the end of next month. Um, Excel will be filing a new electric resource plan or ERP. So this ERP will detail their plan for which resources they'll utilize to provide electricity to their customers, which make up more than half of Colorado's population. So if XL is getting a C right now and also kind of barely because of that 11th hour coal retirement, right, the Hayden plant that we mentioned, um, you know, think of this ERP as like a final report, you know, it's like a big opportunity to change their grade. Robust and timely investment in renewables could bump up their score. But if XL continues to invest in fossil fuels, we could see their grade drop even lower. So Colorado ratepayers deserve an A-plus utility, and we need to do everything we can to get XL to deliver an excellent ERP and earn some extra credit this year. So we have tons of big ideas for actions that we can take this year, but we want to hear from you too. Uh, so hopefully you kept menti.com open because we'll use it one more time. Um, so same website and number, I'm going to go ahead and share that in the chat again. Um, and then I'm going to share my screen so we can watch the results. Excellent. So we'll move to our next slide here. Um, which is about what kind of action would you be most excited about participating in this year on Excel? And you can actually rank these choices. Um, so I'm really excited to see um, what kind of, um, you know, tactics and opportunities um, you all might be interested in as folks that, um, you know, are interested in climate change and care about making a difference on Excel this year. So I'll wait, um, pause here and um, take a second and see what results we have. Awesome, lots of love for meeting with local decision makers so far. That's great. Ooh, public comments taking the lead though. <laughs> uh, this is so fun. This is a it's, thrilling race to be watching. I know, right? right? <laughs> 
if folks are curious too, because I think um, you know we might have more votes rolling in, I can also share the final results um, in a follow-up email. Um, but yeah, this is so cool. All right, we'll give it a few more seconds. All right. It looks like we have a meeting with local decision makers. Oh, no, <laughs> public comments just edged out. So those are our top two, um, meeting with local decision makers and regulatory public comments, which I, as an organizer, like this is music to my ears. These are two tactics that I think are gonna be really, really important um, in terms of influencing EXO um, as far as their ERP this year. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Um, and I'm really excited um, now to invite y'all um, to a new collaborative space where you'll be able to stay up to date on opportunities that use all of these different skills that we just voted on and more. Um, so we are forming the Accelerate Climate Action Coalition. It is a group to stay organized and keep the pressure on Excel over the course of this ERP filing process. So we'll be meeting monthly starting in early March next month. Um, to share one big Excel action opportunity that you can do with your friends, family, and community. Um, so it would mean the world to me if you would join our Accelerate Climate Coalition. Um, there's a form which I'm about to share in the chat that you can use to indicate interest. I also will make sure to share that out in a follow-up email. Um, so just give me one second and I will drop that URL for us. Awesome, just shared that in the chat. Um, so I'm so excited um, to work with those of you that are interested in um, continuing to take action on Excel and learning more. Um, yeah, just really looking forward to sharing this space with y'all where we can stay coordinated on the effort to accelerate the transition to renewable energy sources. Um, awesome, with that, I think we can go ahead and move into Q&A and we're just about at eight o'clock here. So I'm glad that we finished on time. Um, so yeah, if anyone has questions, I'm going to go ahead and go through the chat now and read them out for our uh, presenters. Of course, it's not a perfect system. There's a lot of messages in the chat right now. So if I do miss your question, um, please just know that you can follow up with us at any time. Okay, cool. And I saw someone asked for my contact info. I'll go ahead and drop my email in the chat. And I am looking forward to getting in touch. Well, I'm going to look through and see if we can find some questions. Um, ooh, here's an interesting question from Will Hodges. What's more important, targeting Excel or the PUC? Um, yeah, I, I'd love to hear from other speakers, but I actually kind of want to take a stab at this first, if that's okay. Um, I think that both, um, both are really important targets as decision makers. Um, you know, Excel has the power to make the commitments to transition to renewable energy, but um, all of Excel's, um, you know, decisions and their eventual ERP that they file will be approved by the Public Ut Utilities Commission. So the, the PUC has kind of the power to rubber stamp Excel's approval or to say, no, like we need to see you do better um, or make changes, et cetera. Um, so yeah, Anna or anything else or anyone else, I don't know if there's anything that you would add to that. Um, only, only a timeline to it. So I would say now until um, until the PUC opens the docket for Excel's IRP plan, um, it'd be really important to target Excel as well as legislators. There's all kinds of stuff that um, uh, you know we could see Excel trying to get away with at the Capitol this year, for example. And so we're going to want to make sure that legislators know what we expect to see from the utility, including more clean energy less fossil fuels um, and more affordable and just rates as well. Um, and then once the PUC docket does open, you know, it's going to be kind of a marathon. It won't be a sprint. This ERP will likely last, you know, a year or two as they typically do. And so we'll need uh, folks focused at the PUC to make sure that the commissioners are hearing from communities and know what Colorado communities all across our state want. Because um, one thing I will say about a lot of our state's regulatory processes is that um, they're pretty Denver centric, like a lot of these hearing rooms, for example, are even just in Denver. Um, and so our state decision makers end up hearing a lot from folks in the Denver area, which is good. And we need to make sure that they're hearing from all of the state because Excel has 
territory all across the state as shown by the diverse voices on this call tonight. Um, so long, long answer to that question, but uh, PUC will ultimately be the big decider like Ren said. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that before we move on? Cool. Um, real quick, I'm seeing one question here. Where would the actions take place? Right now, all the actions that we are planning are virtual, um, or are there things that you could do solo in your community without meeting up with other folks? Um, so yeah, for right now, unfortunately, we're really excited to get back in person with y'all um, once it's safe to do so. but. Um, yeah, everything is, the plus side is, yeah, everything's accessible from everywhere in the state. So we're really excited to get um, more different communities involved. Um, let's see. I see a question from Marge. Does Excel participate in just transition to transition coal workers into sustainable energy jobs? Does anyone else want to take that? Otherwise, I'd be happy to. Okay. Um, so until recently, a lot of utilities weren't required to do any kind of just transition planning, and, and still it's really weak what they do have to plan for here in Colorado. Um, so as far as answering the question directly, does Excel participate in just transition planning? Um, because they are going through a PUC process, this IRP again is going to happen at the Public Utilities Commission, thanks to some legislation passed in 2019, they, as part of that plan, they do have to do some transition planning, though it's not very thorough. It's, it's more like an assessment of what kind of changes will have to happen job-wise, infrastructure-wise, community-wise, organization-wise, um, but it at least helps communities, workers, us the PUC plan for what's going to be changing and and who and, and where we need to um, make sure there is a fair transition. So that's what's required. You know, we also passed legislation in 2019 creating the Office of Just Transition, but it's not funded. And so it's not able to do the full extent of what it really could do to help workers and communities and, and push um, utilities to support workers and communities in the transition. And so you know, I see some chats here from, from people like Jeff and others about contacting your legislators. Um, contacting your legislators about funding the Office of Just Transition will be a big deal. You'll certainly see, you know, emails from Sierra Club, I'm sure, on that this year. Um, and we just need to make sure that that office has the funding to do what it needs to do. And then the last thing I'll share is that um, Excel did say when they announced their Hayden retirement in early January that they weren't going to lay off any of the workers. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a fair and just transition, right? Um, we need to make sure there's things like retraining and like good severance packages and things like that to actually support the workers and communities that are transitioning as well. Great. Thanks, Anna. Cool. Um, I will go ahead and move on. Um, I'm going to focus. There's a lot of questions. So I'm going to focus on the ones that um, folks haven't already started to answer in the chat. Um, so I have a question from Kevin Mack in Colorado Springs. What's the best way to put pressure on Excel if you're not one of their rate payers? Which, what a great question. Thanks for being in this fight with us. <laughs> I'll field this one since I also live in Colorado Springs. <laughs> Um, well, I, you know, I think the answer to that, Kevin, is that um, a lot of people worked on the Martin Drake and uh, Nixon coal plant uh, retirement in our coalition that weren't rate payers um, of Colorado Springs utilities. And I think the best thing that we can do is to uplift the voices of frontline communities around the coal plants. Um, so if you know someone or you're aware of a community that is being directly impacted, you can highlight um, that struggle and really uplift those voices. We can also, even though we're not rate payers of Excel, we still live in Colorado. We are still affected by the pollution and by the toxic um, <clears throat> culture of Excel energy. One of the things that we always talk about in this group, um, in this organizing circle, is how they name their coal plants after indigenous tribes um, mm -hmm. and how foul that is. Um, so you can still advocate to Excel, you can still support um, this campaign, you can show up for meetings, you can tweet, you can write your legislators, 
um, because of, you know, there's also like the larger climate plans of Colorado. There's SB 1261, um, the greenhouse gas emissions, everything that has to be done by 2030. And that's a statewide issue. Um, and since, you know, <laughs> there's no such thing um, as like a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. We're all, and Audre Lorde said that's one of my favorite quotes. Um, but, uh, you know, we can definitely still participate in a campaign like this because it does affect our whole entire community and the entire state. Um, and living in Colorado Springs, um, people from across the state supported us um, in our fight for a just and equitable transition from coal here. Um, so I think we can do the same um, for our other community members. Check. And I just want to uplift something in the chat too. Those are all great points, Amy, but um... Jamie Valdez has made a really good point in the chat, which is that Pueblo, home to the largest coal plant and biggest climate polluter in the state, is not XL ratepayer territory, uh, but they're still getting all that pollution. Yeah, absolutely. There are so, 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 so many people that are not XL ratepayers necessarily that are stakeholders in um, XL's decision making processes. Um, I mean, you know, they power most of our states, so they have, you know, really far reaching climate impacts that will, um, you know, affect all of us. So, yeah, thank you, um, everyone, for those super thorough answers. Um, scrolling through here, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat, but if I miss anything, if, ever, if anyone wants to come off mute and shout out a question, also feel free to. Um, but yeah, if we don't have any other questions, then I think we can wrap up. Ren, yeah. There, I just wanted to point out there's been a little discussion going on there about Excel's renewable energy capability, and I'm not sure everybody. Certainly, the folks on on the phone, if anybody's on their phone, they can't see the chat. And one of the things that I want to point out is that, uh, and it's kind of ironic for us here in Pueblo, um, and Jamie commented on this also that Excel is extremely proud of their very large massive solar facility here in town right next door to the coal-fired power plant as well as the facility they're uh, working with the steel mill to build so they can do renewable when they're of a mind to and we don't get any of the power from that um, solar plant either but we get the pollution from the uh, coal-fired power plant all the same. Yeah, thank you to those who uplifted that question in the chat as well as Velma. Um, yeah, that's something we're going to address. Um, yeah, and I mean, we have studies and data that suggest that, you know, that have shown us that wind is already the, the cheapest source of electricity for uh, Colorado ratepayers. So um, in terms of, you know, economic feasibility, um, you know, we already live in the future where um, that transition is, you know, technically feasible. Yeah, and I see a couple of questions that I can answer really quick too. Um, so Excel has, I think, 700 megawatts of solar right now. They have about 1,100 megawatts of wind on their system. That's what makes up that 23% of their fossil fuel assets that they have plans to replace or have already replaced with clean energy. Um, and they could just have so much more. So that's a quick answer to that question. And then just to put a finer point on some of the things that Velma and Ren just said, when Excel made its commitment to 80% carbon reductions in 20, or by 2030, um, they made that commitment back in 2018. In 2018, so three years ago, they said that they could hit 80% carbon reductions um, with existing technology. So that means we don't need to wait for anything between now and 2030 to hit that goal. Like we could literally just do it now and yet we haven't seen any plans for near term emissions reductions through near term clean energy investment. And we're actually seeing this with a lot of utilities where they have these goals by 2030 and 2035. And so they're making these plans to build out renewable energy closer to those dates rather than now, when really we have the technology now, it's cost effective to do it right now because coal is so expensive and clean energy is so cheap. Um, and then on top of that, we have to do it now because we need to reduce emissions as soon as possible by as much as possible. And so, um, yeah, Excel has what it needs to make some big moves right now. And, and hopefully we'll see a reflection of that in the plan they file in March. And if we don't, we're gonna need to hold their feet to the fire.
Great. I have, I see one more question that just came into the chat um, for you, Julie. Can't XL meet C reduction goals by increasing natural gas? Hmm, love the question. Um, yes, or like, or reduction goals could be achieved by by increasing natural gas, but you know, that's not, if it's not in concert with decreasing existing fossil fuels, and that's still never going to be the cheapest way to achieve emissions reductions or the healthiest for Colorado communities. We also don't know that they can do that. We'll know more when we see the plan that they file. Um, for their clean energy plan, which is their plan to reach 80% reductions by 2030, which they'll file with their IRP next month. Um, so that's why we expect to see a little bit of gas in there, but we just fundamentally disagree on the role that gas should be playing in our energy future in Colorado, and that's okay. Is uh, the people in Pueblo, are they going to be subsidizing the uh, big uh, solar plant that they're building there, or is that going to be statewide? The plant that already has plans and is or yeah. is already being built? Yeah, so um, I don't know exactly the answer to that question, but when the Colorado Energy Plan was approved, which was the plan that that was all part of back in, so it would have been 2018 now. Velma, do you have an answer to the question? Um, the people in Pueblo um, would not be paying for the plant um, because uh, we're not XL rate payers. Um, and um, it would be um, the, the question about what percent of that installation is being paid for by their existing rate payers um, is one I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not, it's not it's those not. of us in Pueblo. So um, the, the combined plan is going to save rate payers about a quarter of a billion dollars in Colorado. Um, so there's going to be a lot of savings that yeah. actually come from replacing two of those coal units with all the clean energy. Yeah. And that's a good point. Units one and two are already scheduled to close in um, 2022 and 2025, I believe. It's just the giant third unit that they don't plan to close till 2070. Hi, this is Judy. And I, I'm seeing stuff in, in the chat about what is concerning me, the, the idea that natural gas allegedly could actually been, be said to um, clean up the carbon problem. And I, it was my understanding that with all the methane flares in, involved with fracking, that it really isn't better for carbon. Is that not accurate? Judy, you are spot on. Frack, when you burn gas, um, methane's actually a fossil fuel that is 84 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon even is. So in right. a lot of ways, it's actually worse. So I, I wouldn't, I, I would imagine people who are, would be against that would be screaming bloody murder that that's not accurate. That, is that correct? And those are the kinds of things we need to make sure we're telling our legislators, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think there's definitely yep. a really prevalent kind of right. um, false messaging around natural gas as a as exact. A and there's a big campaign on to do so-called clean gas, which is, in, to my mind, the equivalent of clean coal. Um, which is made by burning trash and plant waste. Um, so they have to heat up the oven to burn the plant and trash waste using usually natural gas. And then they take the gas from that and burn it to create energy and call themselves um, clean gas, syn gas. You'll hear it called biomass um, and any number of things. So I encourage people to keep their eye out for synthetic gas or clean gas as well as for um, fossil gas. Although fossil gas is admittedly worse than, than synthetic gas, but it's a much more potent um, climate, green um, emissions from gas-fired power plants contribute more to um, climate change than do emissions from coal-fired plants. So it's not a solution for climate change and it's not a solution for public health. Amen. 
<laughs> and and Jamie Valdez just put in the chat that the the Everaz project has the potential to prove that even large scale heavy industry can can be fully powered by renewable energy. Hmm. I just want to chime in here and say, I mean, I, I don't know about y'all, but this is this is my jam. I love conversations like this. This is what I feel like I talk about all day. Um, and I want to just share that I, this is the kind of stuff that we're going to talk about and like educate ourselves on and like arm ourselves with in the Accelerate Climate Action Coalition that Sierra Club and 350 are starting with these monthly meetings. Um, we're going to make sure that we all know everything we need to know and know who needs to know it in order to make this transition happen as speedily as possible in the state. And so we'll be using that space to do things like share results and, and, and our take on um, the PUC staff investigation on the Comanche 3 or Pueblo 3 um, coal plant, as well as our take on um, breaking down probably the thousands of pages of Excel's ERP and our issues with it and what needs to be better and what we can be advocating for. So we'll like continue to have these conversations in these monthly meeting spaces. And I'm sure Ren can say a lot more about that, but that's one of the things that I'm really looking forward to the space for so we can continue conversations like this. So will we get talking points, hopefully, that are dumbed down for those of us that don't do this all the time? Absolutely. Well, I hate the phrase dumbed down, but <laughs> but yeah, because it is that they are just really like nuanced and like complex issues that, you know, we don't spend a lot of time doing community education on. So I'm really excited to, um, yeah, continue to arm our communities with knowledge about these things. I'd say that's definitely a big goal of the um, Accelerate Coalition and of our of our work overall. Um, but yeah, lots of false messaging out there about natural gas. So I'm really, um, really thankful for this conversation. Um, I also want to uplift a couple of comments in the chat that I've seen about the um, kind of extraction and supply side um, with fracking and all of the, the damage um, that that causes and concerns around that. Because um, yeah, that's also a, a very important part of this conversation. Um, Paula Clements, I see your question. How can you find out if Excel is in your area? Does that just mean, if that just means like if you're served by Excel Energy or if they serve people in your area, um, there's data about all of the different areas that Excel uh, Energy serves on their website. So you should be able to look into that and find that out pretty easily. Hmm. Yeah, okay, cool, cool. So yeah, I see you're in Breck. Yeah, that's, yeah one of the many Ready for 100 communities that, um, you know, is gonna depend on Excel and their commitments to clean energy to actually meet those commitments. It's gonna take awesome. work, I don't trust them. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is gonna take work. I'm really excited um, to get us all organized and to continue to, um, yeah, take actions through the rest of this year. And I'm excited for you to organize us all with monthly actions for the next couple of years throughout the ERP. Yeah. yeah, I'm really excited. I think it's gonna be um, super important, especially um, a little bit further on when we have opportunities for public comments. Um, yeah, I'm really excited for us to show up in droves. Um, but yeah, I think that that is all of our questions. Um, is there any anyone else any other questions that I might have missed or just any other thoughts? Thank you for all you guys do. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Ren, do you wanna tell people how to save the chat if they wanna save it? Ooh, yeah, good call. Um, let's make sure that I can. Yeah, I'm just making sure everybody has permission. Um, yes, but if you are interested in saving the chat so you can go back through any messages or like check out resources that folks shared, you can hit the, the little three dots in the top right corner of the box where you type your message. And then there should be an option there that says save chat. Um, and we also recorded this presentation and we'll be sharing uh, more resources with y'all um, afterwards. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, with that, I will say thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, yeah, I'm really excited for a year of action on Excel and um, have a great rest of your night. Thank you. You too.
Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, y'all. Go team. Celebrate <laughs> climate action.